Good morning to you all. Good and it's good to see the kids here this morning as well. I believe you've all got a copy of the notice. If you have it, please let me know and we can forward one to you later. But um, there are a few things I want to highlight. So we continue with our warm spaces and um, I believe we've been featured in the Bracknell News. So more people will be probably more people will be coming. Um, so if you can volunteer, please let Mike know. We also have a um, church council on the 25th, that's Wednesday. So if you can make it on Zoom as well. If you haven't got a link, please um, let us know and we can send you a link. The other thing, I think there's, there's some good news. Um, Trish Howard um, has a new grandchild, um, eight pound 15. Her name is Lily LaRose. So, <laughs> some good news. Please um, join me in welcoming Mike, who will be leading the service this morning. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. It's uh, good to be uh, back here with you in Bracknell and uh, those who are joining on Zoom as well. For our call to worship, some words from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. So that's what we do with our opening hymn now, which is uh, number 25 in Singing the Faith, if you're following it in the books. God is here as we, his people, meet to offer praise and prayer.
So we come before God with our prayers. Let us pray. Father God, we meet together in your house to offer our praise and prayer to you. We praise you for the wonders of your creation and for the remarkable way that everything you have made works together to show your glory. We praise and thank you for coming to us in Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us, who did great works, and who gave his life so that we might be saved. And we look to the day when all things in heaven and on earth will be united under his kingship. And we praise you for pouring out your grace on the church through your Holy Spirit, who guides us, strengthens us, and unites us in your service. Father, we confess that we have not lived our lives as you would want us to. You love the church and you call us to care for one another. But we have quarreled and hurt each other's feelings. You call us to be united, but we have shown our divisions to the world. You call us to rely on one another, but we have been jealous and independent. We have let you down, and we are sorry. Thank you, Father, that you are always ready to forgive us when we come to you in penitence. Help us now to make a fresh start, trusting in you. Father, we pray that we may know your presence with us in our worship that it may be worthy of your greatness and power. Help us through our worship to explore how our daily lives can be enriched and invigorated by our faith in you. Fill our hearts with love for you, we pray, and for each other. Speak your word into our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The week from the 18th to the 25th of January each year is marked in churches around the world as the week of prayer for Christian unity. Um, and I, I looked up how long this has been in place and I was surprised. It started in 1908, a long time ago, well over a century that churches around the world have been praying during this week in January, for unity amongst Christians, amongst churches throughout the world. And so I'm taking that as, as the theme for our worship this morning, Christian unity. And, and we know, we think we know in our personal lives how, how uh, unpleasant it is when you fall out with someone, when you have a disagreement with a friend or a relative and, and you're not not speaking to them for a while and how, how uncomfortable and, and unpleasant it is 
And it's the same with churches, that over the centuries, the churches in, in different parts of the world and in, in uh, local places as well have fallen out with one another over one issue or, or something else. And sometimes the issue that itself is long since forgotten, but we still have that separation between us and between us and other Christians. And it's something of a, a tragedy that, that there are still divisions between the churches. There are positive signs as well when churches are able to come together and we get to know the other Christians around in our town and in our locality and, and to do things together with them. But and 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 I, I know from my own experience what it's like uh, when when you make up with someone that you've had a falling out with that reconciliation is a, is a real sort of positive boost. And that's the same with churches that we should be working to come back together uh, and and to to reconcile our differences in whatever way we can without diminishing the things where we have genuine um differences of, of belief and without uh, sort of putting down anything that uh, that other people may genuinely and honestly believe to be correct we can still work together in so many so many things so that's the theme for our worship this morning and it's a theme that's uh, picked up in the next hymn that we're going to sing Jesus stand among us at the meeting of our lives mm -hmm. And if you're using the books, we're singing just verses one and two, not, not the third verse. It's number 30 in, in the theme that's there. So now we're going to hear our gospel reading. If you want to follow along in the church Bibles, um, you can find it on page 915. The gospel reading is Matthew. Chapter 4, reading verses 12 to 25. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtala, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, 
the light has dawned. From that time on, <clears throat> Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake and they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, <clears throat> and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Thanks be to God for his word. <clears throat> so Jesus began his ministry by calling together a group of disciples and bringing crowds of people to, to follow him. So we'll pick up on um, Jesus's ministry in our next hymn, The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy, for Jesus restores what sin would destroy. It's hymn 255.
And that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this one of you said, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, and still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, though no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of God be emptied of its power. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul was concerned that the church in Corinth was dividing into different factions, different groups who disagreed. In our gospel reading, we heard how when Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, his ministry of, of teaching and preaching and healing, of, uh, as Matthew puts it, bringing light to people in darkness, quoting the prophet Isaiah, when, when Jesus began his ministry, one of the first things he did was to gather a group of people around him to support him and assist him in the ministry, the first disciples. And we heard about the calling of, of four of them, Simon, Peter and Andrew, James and John, four fishermen who Jesus said would now be fishing for people their role or part of their role was to bring people together to Jesus, help to build a, a community of people prepared to follow Jesus and to live by Jesus's teachings. And large crowds did follow him. Some of them undoubtedly were just curious, wanted to know what this was about, what what this guy was was speaking about what and find out what was going on but others among them became convinced that they had found their purpose in life and were prepared to commit everything to Jesus and to stick with him and follow him in his ministry and stick with him through thick and thin even when things got difficult later on they were together with a common purpose, a community. And yet, despite that unity of purpose, despite Jesus's explicit prayer on, on the night of the Last Supper, that all his followers should be united, and that includes us because he prays for those who will believe in me in times to come. His prayer that everyone who follows him should be united, despite all that, the history of the church is littered with arguments and divisions. The disciples themselves quarreled amongst each other. We read that in the Gospels. The church at Corinth, as we heard, was, was disunited, dividing into factions. And there are other quarrels and fallings out in, in the book of Acts. You can read about them. And through, throughout the centuries that followed, the church has argued and split over all sorts of different issues 
the split between the East and Western churches in the 11th century, the Protestants and Catholics in the 16th century, the nonconformists breaking from the Church of England, the Methodists again later in the 18th century splitting from the Church of England, and then in the 19th century Methodism itself split into the Wesleyans and the Primitives and some others as well. And all these splits and schisms have led directly or indirectly to people being persecuted because they didn't believe the right things, to wars and atrocities from the Inquisition to the troubles in Northern Ireland and beyond. In the last century, things began to reverse to some extent. And there was the growth of the ecumenical movement of churches cooperating and coming back together. The World Council of Churches was, was founded and others like the, the, the churches together in Britain and Ireland and so forth. Methodists became, Methodist were, union happened in 1932. So the Methodist church became united once again. And then the Congregationalists and Presbyterians joined to form the United Reformed Church. And, and in other parts of the world, other churches have, have combined and come back together. And at a local level now, we do have much more cooperation than, than there used to be, where we often have joint services with Christians in, in other churches. Uh, sometimes churches share buildings and sometimes they even worship together and become one congregation in a, a local ecumenical partnership, an LEP. It's, in, it's good that in our own Methodist circuit, there are no fewer than three LEPs amongst the, the seven churches, at, uh, two, two with the Anglicans at, at Woos Hill and at the Pines, and one with the URC at uh, High Cross in Camberley. But again, there have also become some new tensions and strains between Christians in recent years. There's all the debates that there's been in, in the Church of England over women's ordination and some who still won't accept that, for example. And more recently, in practically every denomination of the church, debates over sexuality and same-sex marriage and people falling out over that. Um, there are people you, you may have seen in the news this week that some of the problems that the Church of England is is having debating about that issue and, and where they're going to stand on it. And I know of people in Methodism who have resigned their membership because of our conference's decision on same sex marriage a year or two ago. And it's not just on issues of faith and doctrine. At a personal level, Christians fall out with one another too, whether it's about styles of worship and the music that we have in our worship, whether it's about the, the furniture in the church, people who want pews or chairs or different sorts of decor in the church. Often it can be very, very trivial matters, personality clashes, people who are insensitive or people who overreact to things who does what job in the church? Why was so-and-so asked to do that and not me? I would have done it better than they did it. They don't do it properly. Nobody thanks me for all the work that I put in. All these sort of things that go on. As Christians, we ought to be different from the world outside. We ought to be above those sort of petty disagreements. And sometimes we are, but all too often we're not. The church has more than enough instances of selfishness and arrogance and power seeking and possessiveness and stubbornness and people resigning and going off in a half. Why are Christians so bad at getting on with one another and staying together? Partly, we must confess, it is that we are not sufficiently Christ-like. We have not allowed him to transform us into the people that he wants us to be. We're still, to some extent, stuck in our old ways of self-centeredness and ignorance and pride. 
And also it can be a sign of how important our faith is to us. That some of the issues here are central to who we are and how we live. And so because of the, how important that is to us, we're unwilling to compromise about them. We don't want to give up something that we believe is essential to our faith in God. Or we don't want to allow something that we believe is contrary to God's will. And so we have disagreements. And there is this tension between Jesus's desire for unity amongst all believers and our sincere beliefs on a particular issue where others may differ from us. And sometimes it seems you can't fulfill one without compromising on the other. Something has got to give. And usually what gives is unity because we're quite a stubborn lot. But all of this has a negative effect on the church and on our ability to carry out Christ's work. Our lack of unity undermines the work of the church. It undermines our message. It undermines people's faith and ministry. It distracts us from our real mission because of all the energy that we waste in, in quarrels and disagreements that could do great works in spreading the gospel if we, if we were united in it. And it demotivates us. We start questioning our faith. Is this really the body of Christ? Are we really God's chosen people? And look around at how we behave. And so people are perhaps reluctant to get more involved and to, to do more to serve God if they feel that's just going to lead to arguments and disagreements. It undermines our leaders. Everything becomes an uphill struggle. There isn't any space to have that bigger vision of where God is leading us if all our efforts are spent on trying to hold the church together. And it gives out the wrong message. It affects how people outside see us and see the church and see God. It sets us back in our witness. They don't, it doesn't fit with the gospel of love that we're trying to proclaim if we come across as quarreling. We're seen as hypocrites. And you know how the, the media love to report um, any sort of disputes and fallings out in the church. You know, Vicar Sachs, organist, half the congregation quit. And they love to, to gleefully report every accusation, every intemperate remark. It makes great copy. But it sets back the work of the church. It set back, it harms people's impression of the church. Jesus prayed for all believers to be united so that the world may believe. That's the reason he gave, so that the world may believe. And the corollary is that where we're not united, people won't believe our message. And that's one of the factors in the decline of the church and our influence in the world is that we don't look sufficiently like a fellowship that's built on a message of love for everyone. So how do we take seriously Jesus's prayer for our unity and Paul, Paul's urging to the church in Corinth and, and to us that we should all agree? How do we take it seriously? In the past, a lot of the effort in this respect went into big unity schemes, trying to merge denominations at the top level. And there was some success, the United Reformed Church I've already mentioned, and, and others as well. But, uh, but some have never really got off the ground. Several times, Methodists and the Church of England have had schemes to try and work towards unity, and it's never actually come off. As well as the differences that we may have on certain points of theology over the years, inevitably of, of work operating separately, we've developed different structures, different practices. And so even if you could resolve the theological differences, there's a whole host of practical issues that would have to be resolved. And it could be quite a nightmare. How do you align Methodist circuits with Anglican parishes? What, what about Wales and Scotland, which are part of the Methodist church, but not part of the Church of England? You can imagine all the time and effort and resources that would 
have to be spent on trying to resolve issues like this and the inevitable disagreements and people seeing things as, as winners and losers on particular issues. And we could spend years focusing on the the few, the five percent, if you like, of things that where that we do different that are largely peripheral matters, and ignoring the 95%, the core of our faith that we hold in common. So perhaps a better approach is a bottom-up approach to church unity, where it starts with ourselves and our attitudes to other Christians. At the root of it needs to be Jesus's new command to his disciples that they should love one another, that we should love one another. And that should be the starting point. So within our own fellowship, we need to think well of everyone here, of our fellow Christians, be understanding and forgiving. And if someone acts in a way that seems selfish or unreasonable, don't respond in kind. Even when we disagree over things, try not to fall out over it. We should be slow to, to, to resign from things and walk out because it's, it's rarely worth it. And don't make personal attacks on one another. Don't accuse people of having wrong motives. Even if it's true, it's not helpful to say that. And I'm not saying I've never done any of these things, but I ought not to have done. When we love one another, we won't rush to pass judgment on people. We won't try to take sides and get entrenched in our different positions. Rather, we will be wanting to build bridges and make connections to see the other person's point of view, to be prepared to reconsider our initial opinion. However strongly we feel about things, and as I say, some of these are our deep issues of faith, however strongly we feel about things, none of us can say that we're right all the time. We know that. And we need to have the humility to admit the possibility that this is one of the few things that maybe I am mistaken about. So maybe I should listen to what the other people are saying and respect them and respect what they do and acknowledge their gifts and what they bring to the church and value what they do, even if it doesn't fit in with my own view of how things perhaps ought to be done. We are one body with many parts, all performing different roles, but the intention is that we are working together. And then if we can maintain our fellowship and that common purpose within our congregation based on that, this love for one another, we can take that same approach into the wider church, into our contacts and our relationships with Christians elsewhere and of other denominations. In fact, as, as the church's um, position in society, both in, in numbers and in influence, has declined, it becomes ever more important that we build links with our fellow Christians and with other churches around us, that we are working together and, and pooling our resources and, and what we can do together. So rather than noticing the differences of, of how they do things in a strange way and they worship in funny ways and things, rather than noticing that, we need to start to remind ourselves what all Christians hold in common. Jesus Christ and faith in him as the key to our salvation, that Jesus was uniquely God and man, and through his death and resurrection, he can take away our sin and our failure. And make, we make, so we make a commitment to follow him and to live by his standards. There's, there's more, there's much more to Christianity, but this is the heart of Christianity. All Christians have these things in common, and all who have these things in common are Christians, are our fellow brothers and sisters, and we should welcome them and share with them and join with them, worship with them, share communion with them. Because these things are so much more important 
than all the disagreements that we might have over issues of doctrine or different styles of worship or whatever it might be. We need to see any Christian as a fellow pilgrim with the same ultimate goal as we have, that we have far more in common with each other than we do with most of the people out there who don't believe in Jesus Christ. And if we each draw closer to Christ in, in our faith and the way we live our lives, we can't help but draw closer to one another as well, even though we may be coming from different directions, from different viewpoints and seeing him from different angles. So we need to foster our links with other local churches and get to know each other and to, to celebrate the diversity that we have and to, to share together in activities and worship with them in an attitude of, of openness and mutual acceptance, celebrating what we have in common. The less energy that we use arguing or trying to plough our own separate furrow, the more we can use to spread the gospel together and to, to be a witness for Christ. The more we're seen working together, the, the stronger our witness is. People will then see that we're not rival brands in competition with one another, but we're the same makers' products for different parts of the markets directed at, at people with different, different needs or different requirements. I want to finish with a quotation from the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, in his sermon on the Catholic spirit, which was addressing the issues of, of Christians having different faith and practice. Wesley says, I do not mean be of my opinion. You need not. I do not expect or desire it. Neither do I mean I will be of your opinion. I do not mean embrace my modes of worship or I will embrace yours. We must both act as each is fully persuaded in his own mind. Hold you fast that which you believe is most acceptable to God. And I will do the same. If your heart is as my heart, if you love God and all people, I ask no more. Give me your hand. Amen. So we move from John Wesley to his brother Charles, one of Charles's hymns about unity in the church. Christ from whom all blessings flow, perfecting the saints below. Number 676.
Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for all the good things that you have given us. And so we dedicate to you now these offerings of money and the offerings that we have made in other ways for the work of the church, that you would bless them and use them to fulfill Christ's ministry in this town and in our world. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Now have our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with our hearts full of humility and trust in your love and grace. Give strength and courage to our church leaders, congregation, and community as we continue to follow the, in the footsteps of Christ and share in his message of repentance, salvation, and unity. Father, we are reminded of the power of the gospel and the call to repentance. Help us to draw from the good wine of the gospel and bring new life to those around us. Give us the strength and the courage to proclaim the good news of salvation to the world and be a light in the darkness. Lord, we pray for our country's leaders. Guide them to make decisions that will bring about peace and prosperity to your people. Father, commit the leaders of all nations into your hand. Guide them by your wisdom and compassion. May their hearts be filled with your love and let them lead their nations in a way that honors you. Father, we entrust in you the cares and worries of our people and people in our congregation. We come before you today with specific requests of your healing and touch on the lives of your children and those close to us. Some of whom we mentioned in silence. Father, well, we also give special mention to Carol, Pauline, Fiona, David, Terry, Mike, Mike Morley, and Mrs. Atkins. We put our faith in your promise to work all things out for our good. And we ask your wisdom and encouragement as we strive to work in obedience and faithfulness. Father, we give thanks for your both boundless love and mercy. And we pray that this will be a, a blessing to all of us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thanks. Amen. <laughs> So we sing our final hymn now, number 691. What shall our greeting be? Sign of our unity? Jesus is Lord.
So may the Holy Spirit unite us with God's people throughout the world as we witness to the gospel of Christ and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.